this uh, session is about the technology of um, self-driving cars and how that's really going to play out over the next uh, few years here. So we're going to do a quick introduction of the uh, panel. We've got um, uh, Ravi from Savari who's doing kind of vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to something communication. Um, Modar from Iris which is using a lot of AI for uh, discerning um, information about um, people and um, Louis from Quanergy, which is um, one of the premier LiDAR companies. So we'll start with just very quick introductions and then we'll switch into the questions and the topics. So um, Ravi, if you'd like to just give a, a quick bio. Hi, I'm Ravi Puala, I'm founder and CEO of Savari. Um, we are a V2X sensor company uh, focusing on vehicle to everything communications. Um, as you know that the penetration of Wi-Fi and cellular chipsets into cars is still about 25%. Um, as we see that most of these modems are currently used for connectivity, and we are looking at repurposing them to do for active safety, mainly for crash avoidance and other applications. Hello, everyone. My name is Modar Alawi. I'm a founder and a CEO of Iris. We do um, deep learning-based um, in-cabin uh, vision AI for driver and occupants monitoring. We go beyond face analytics to activity recognition and action recognition, et cetera. Um, been doing this for a couple of years, and we believe this would be critical for what's soon to be known as the third living space after homes and offices. And I'm, I'm Louie Aldada. I'm the CEO and founder of Quanergy. Uh, we make uh, solid-state LiDAR. We are the only company that makes completely solid-state, I'm not talking about MicroMEMS, truly solid-state LiDAR that's uh, high performance, very high resolution and accuracy, uh, reliability, no, it's all silicon CMOS, no moving parts, and is really low cost, uh, a couple of hundred bucks in volume. It's still only several, several hundred bucks if you buy a single unit. Uh, so uh, we provide um, the most capable eyes, and we just heard about the brains and the communication, so we have a good mix here. Okay, great. So um, maybe, Lou, I can start with you and just uh, get your perspective on what does the next three or four years look like on the road, and how does this, all this technology, like there's a lot that is in labs on experiments, you know, under special permit, but when we talk about actual consumers getting in cars, how do you think that looks over the next few years? And what's the first thing that happens? What's the first thing that matters? Yeah, you can already get level two uh, automation, which is uh, advanced uh, driver assist. Uh, in my opinion, the industry is gonna skip level three. It doesn't mean no one is gonna do it, but generally. Level three means you're expected to uh, react frequently. Uh, so if you, if you take a nap, if you're texting, it's, it's just not, realistic uh, to expect the, uh, the whoever is sitting in the driver's seat to react frequently. It could, it could be a few times per minute. So the industry is gonna go, to, go directly to level four. And level five might take till 2025 or beyond. So level four is my uh, qu short answer to the question. Level four is uh, basically a level of automation where the car simply drives itself, but there is a driver in the driver's seat and they they will uh, be expected very infrequently uh, uh, to, to do, uh, react if there is a, a, an extremely unusual situation. Uh, that, that, that level makes sense. Because level five, where, which is truly driverless, where a vehicle without a human being in it comes to pick you up, it, go, it goes to park itself, it drops you off, and you can take a nap in the back. Uh, that's gonna take a lot of development, especially on the software side. The brain has to be just almost as good as, as a human brain in terms of making decisions, making the right decisions. It can be fast, but, but uh, it has to be right. Okay, so for, for level four that you say is coming, is this, um, do we need new laws or we're just doing it under driver assistance laws? Uh, well, level four uh, does need laws, does need support, uh, but not the same as level five. Uh, it's, it's easier to pass those laws because you do have a human being in the driver's seat. Um, and uh, it's, hap it's gonna uh, happen next year, 2018. Uh, we know exactly which, which car makers have those plans. Okay, 
Um, how, how about um, Ravi, Louis, um, what, what are your thoughts on this? How does, how does the technology affect the road that we're all driving on over the next few years? Um, it's 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 going to be affected very very much, but I think the the regulation is really the, the the biggest hurdle here. I mean, we can speculate and say two or three years Tesla sells today full autonomy, uh, or whatever they consider to be level four, I guess, or three, three and a half, but it's not there yet, right? You can you can buy the package and still uh, not have it activated until regulations happen. I think it's going to take some time for. Um, for, for all of this to be well understood, well documented. It's gonna take a lot of mishaps before some um, uh, regulations will occur much quicker than we expect. Um, but there is no question that this is evolving and level three will be here uh, by the end of this year. Uh, level four, like Loe mentioned, is uh, actually in production or slated for production uh, for 2018. And um, um, a lot of others uh, are expecting level five to be ready by 2020. Um, I'm always very cautious about that because what makes it technologically possible doesn't necessarily make it a product. And so to make it, to, for it to be a product, it's an entire ecosystem with regulations, roads, uh, insurance, um, uh, and, 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 and a whole lot of things. All right, so, so Ravi, what do you think about the product? Like what products will come to market? Um, I, you know, the product is going to be more of a, a semi-autonomous car or a fully autonomous car that's going to be integrated into the system, right? I just wanted to add one more thing about the regulation framework. You know, we have cameras and li um, LIDARs, which are the remote sensors, but in order to achieve full autonomy, you have to have um, a cooperative nature between all the cars and the infrastructure. And this is one of the things that our company is focused on, is building this communication framework and NHTSA has just passed a, you know, a rulemaking process to mandate every new car by 2023 should have a communication sensor integrated into it. And this is one of the things um, you know, that V2X is all about, is to repurpose this you know, spectrum um, that's been allocated to have cars to communicate with each other. And those, these sensors are very critical to kind of create the redundancy that's needed um, in the sensor fusion mechanism. Okay. So... so um I've got a question for I don't, I don't know whom, but like my feeling is that if you have really good level two autonomy, meaning it's just driver assistance, mm -hmm. but it's superhuman driver assistance mm -hmm. for the consumer. Let's say I buy buy a Model Three next year or something, uh, assuming the software progresses to where some people think it will. Um, why do I really need anything more? Why do I need level? Like yeah, I can't go to sleep. I need to keep my hands, but don't I get just like. 80% of the benefit from a car where I don't have to think about driving, I don't get into accidents, I don't have to worry about anything, is where's the value for the consumer? Is it really in level five or is it in level two? Level two, some benefits that you do not get at all in level two are productivity. You're, you're not supposed to be texting or emailing or doing anything at all. Uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, stress level uh, in, a, in stop and go situations. Uh, you know, you're, you're still completely driving the car. Just it, it's uh, it's uh, giving you alarms uh, when, when you, you drift out of the lane and such. So, all the really the main benefits we talk about in terms of uh, revolutionizing uh, the future of the automotive industry are not realized at level two. Okay. You know, the best example is, you know, in the Bay Area traffics, who would not like to have automatic braking, right? You're, you're, you're always going back to back on, on you know, Highway 101 or 280. Um, it, it really allows you to be able to, like, you know, if you are distracted for a second and having the car to be able to brake on your behalf is, is, is a huge benefit. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I mean, Level 2 has been around for a year or, or more, at least from the Tesla standpoint. Anybody that owns a Tesla knows exactly what Level two, what they can expect from Level 2. Uh, you're still tied to the drive-in task. You cannot multitask. You cannot do any of these things. Uh, and obviously, um, you, you want to have more time to do more things if you can have a, a machine do the drive-in for you. So any level higher than level two would be nice to have. Um, a, a level five would be ideal, but obviously we're not there yet. So 
Like Louis said, uh, I think level three will somewhat be skipped. At least there is one manufacturer that's skipping it publicly. They talk about it all the time. Um, but what most people are expecting or, uh, or um, are, are uh, probably excited about is, is level four because it's achievable. You can still, you still have to be behind the wheel, so it's not like that scary kind of moment. Uh, the car still has a steering wheel and a pedal or multiple pedals but it does most of the driving for you. So it's, it's, it's the reverse of level two where you need to do most of the driving. And, and I think that's kind of what, when people refer to autonomous driving, that's really where they, what they refer to, at least realistically, knowing when that will happen, from which vehicles, which manufacturers, where, which geography, et cetera. And, uh, and I think it does make a whole lot of difference to have a vehicle with level four as opposed to level two. Okay, great. So, so let's switch tracks a little bit and talk about um, kind of the ecosystem here. As um, Professor X kind of outlined, you've got all sorts of things. You've got sensor makers, you've got car makers, you've got software, um, all, and different flavors of software. Like, how does this play out? Is this going to end up being like more like an Apple surface model where there's everything's integrated under one manufacturer, under one stack, even like same company? Or is it more like Windows, Android, you know, mix and match different solutions and like can both of those exist together? Can they compete against each other? On the tier two level, so on the component manufacturing level, there will be multiple suppliers. Uh, on the tier one level, each uh, tier one meaning, uh, uh, you know, automotive suppliers of the likes of uh, the system integrators, basically, the Delphi, Bosch, Continental, uh, they, they would provide a full system that includes all of the different sensors that come from different suppliers. Uh, I'm going to add that all types of sensors that we talk about, except the ultrasonic sensor, will, for the foreseeable future, all be used. It's not going to be LiDAR or camera or radar. It's going to be all three of those for the foreseeable future. It's just a matter of which does what. Right, there's no doubt there will be a lot of consolidation as, as, as it is the case in every industry and as we've seen over the last couple of years. And obviously that's kind of what's sparking innovation and, and competition, et cetera. But um, uh, uh, there are some, um, you know, the four horsemen or five horsemen in, in automotive tier one uh, suppliers, the Bosch and Delphi and Denso and Conti. And, um, and, and these are the guys that actually almost decide what goes into the vehicle or at least present with a lot of conviction what needs to go into the vehicle for which model. Um, but there will be a lot of consolidation from the tier two level, from the suppliers to the tier one level. Uh, those are um, other components, uh, manufacturers or software guys, uh, et cetera. The model will not change dramatically uh, from what it is today. There will always be OEMs. Maybe there will be some consolidation there. There are a lot of OEMs that have not announced any autonomous plans yet. Think about Mazda and think about some other ones. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, either they're thinking about licensing something from one supplier or from one tier one, and all of a sudden they have what, it, what, it, what they need because they already have distribution. Um, or maybe they're behind the wheel for reasons that we just don't know. But, but it will not be so much difference. There will be a little bit of consolidation, in my opinion, from the OEM standpoint. There will be new entrants. There will be the same tier ones, probably a very little consolidation there, but there will be a lot more consolidation from the tier two uh, level. And, and why do we need more than like two or three autonomous like stack vendors? Like if you look at, you know, mobile OS or desktop OS or everything, like those seem to have always consolidated down to a very small handful. Um, yeah. But here eventually, we're going to have yeah. nine different Google. Eventually. Uh, initially, there will be lots of redundancy. Each uh, automaker will make bets on certain suppliers. And uh, there is time to uh, basically down select the winners because you have redundancy. You don't have to immediately figure out which technology is the winner. But over time, yes, there will be down selection. And there will be one or a few suppliers for each type. 
So I think it, it also goes back to what's the standard platform for some of this fusion integration, right? Today, NVIDIA and Intel are leading some of the sensor fusion architectures. And, you know, a lot of the stacks, a lot of the, you know, uh, application modular platforms are going to be based on how these hardware architectures are going to evolve and whose stacks are going to be predominantly, you know, accepted around the industry. Okay. One more question, and then we're going to do some audience questions. So, uh, like, uh, data, deep learning, um, uh, obviously, this is a big part of what everybody's touting as a uh, key component in terms of the advancement of this. How like important is the data? Is there like a critical mass after which you kind of have enough and you don't need any more? Does the one who just get the most like gazillion miles end up being better? And uh, how, how how does data play out into the whole mix of things? It, it usually is. Uh, th th there there always is a sweet spot between. Uh, quantity of data and quality of data and the software that actually makes use of that or sense of that data. Um, I, I wouldn't say the companies that will prevail are the ones that are going to have the most data or have driven a billion miles or I mean that's just at some point it just reaches ceiling from like a technology standpoint. Um, the variations of situations and scenarios um, could still be, um, you know, with just a million miles as opposed to a billion miles if you want to incorporate all of these variations. Therefore, the quality of the data matters a lot. But, but isn't that like on one hand you're saying, oh, level five is going to take 20 years, and the other hand, oh, I only need a million miles to get everything down. Isn't, isn't the edge cases what you really need? that much more data for? Level five is not going to take 20 years primarily because of the lack of data. Self-driving cars is a solved problem today. Actually, it's being solved. It's a solved problem. It's, uh, it's, it's the ecosystem around it that really needs um, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, um, additional inputs. The cognition, uh, the, whether you will hit the, 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 the pedestrian or, uh, or just you know, go off the cliff. And, and there's a lot of these things. It's not the fact that the car can drive on its own uh, is what makes uh, level you know, five difficult. It's, it's the actual cognition and, 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 and everything around it is from the ecosystem. Um, I, I truly believe that uh, data is great. It's uh, it's the fuel for you know any software, but I, I don't necessarily agree with, with with the idea that whoever has the most data basically will will have the best performing software or technology at all. I think if you go back and look at how much data is being generated um, by these autonomous cars every hour, um, I've seen some statistics which says. 20 terabytes of data being generated every hour on these cars. So now the question comes down to, you know, is the computation is going to happen on the car or on the cloud? So there's always going to be a you know, trade-off between how much computation can be done inside the car versus the cloud. And I think this is where a lot of the data analysis in terms of what algorithms really function very well and doing a post-mortem in terms of, like, what would be a better algorithm to replace some of these. Okay. Maybe I would add one, one thing that th there is different schools of thought about uh, collecting data and deep learning and having that be the, the fundamental uh, approach to, to decision making. Uh, so some people believe in pushing that to an extreme level and uh, just keep teaching the, 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 the algorithms how to react based on uh, you know, trillions of, of, uh, of images. Uh, others uh, believe that it's never going to be a deterministic approach, so it's a no-go, and you just have to uh, uh, do, you know, uh, do simultaneous localization and mapping SLAM and, and make it decisions on the fly as opposed to just be ready with all scenarios being figured out based on lots of uh, data learning. That's right. I think, I think what Lue was mentioning is there is a difference between supervised learning and that's what we're talking about with deep learning and that's still limited. Once we reach unsupervised learning, yes, probably, um, you know, data, more data would matter more. But, but for now, you know, it is supervised and it, it, it can only learn what you can teach it and what, what it's labeled at and, and, and things like that. So, so there is still some limitation there in the AI, the core AI. Itself, and, and I think we're far away from unsupervised learning, where you have uh, machines just learn as as humans just by seeing things repetitively, without necessarily knowing what these things are or having or reading what the labels are. Um, 
and, and in that case, I believe more data would matter more. All right, good. So let's go for some audience questions. And again, whoever has the mic, if you can um, uh, please select uh, someone there. Just a request for everybody. So if you could see on the slides, uh, you can ask questions via the Tycon app, and we would prefer that, you know, so that we can ask more questions. And if people have similar questions, we can aggregate that and ask. And now I'm going to just pass the mic around for a couple of questions we can take now. Hi. Uh, my name is Mohinder Sika with Sensital. So I have a two-part question. First is, uh, how do you stop uh, the, let's say, kid you know, putting up a stop sign and fooling the uh, network in the car? And the broader question is, because of those reasons, do you think the self-driving will actually happen more in constrained requirements, uh, environments, such as in, in, uh, uh, in trucks and in uh, you know, uh, uh, closed areas like campuses rather than in public roads? So, I mean, one of the use cases um, for um, self-driving nature, there's a company called Peloton, which started off with focusing on platooning. So 80% of the traffic, especially on interstate highways, is commercial tracks, right? And um, the notion of platooning is about to making sure that the lead car um, can do the main driving, and the cars that are following it can follow on whatever the actions that the lead car is trying to do. Right? Um, they have shown significant use cases about how much fuel can be saved, how it can be efficient. So this is already being applied and you know um, been tried out in um, on interstate highways. So definitely, it's going to be in a more controlled environment. Um, you know, first it starts with the commercial tracks, and also in some smart cities where they can kind of corridor off and how to set up the infrastructure to allow self-driving cars to you know um, work more cordially. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Rakesh Vedinathan. I have two quick questions. One is, what's your go-to-market model, which is, would you license your technology to, let's say, uh, you know, tier one, uh, tier two companies outside the United States in some cases? Second is, do you have a retrofit model where, you know, existing fleets, can they use your technologies, any of your technologies, to g achieve a certain level of autonomous driving? I think all of us here are set up as tier two suppliers because we provide our technology to be licensed and integrated with an automotive tier one like you know, Delphi, Denso, and Bosch. Um, when it comes to aftermarket technologies, it's, it depends on the combination of the sensors being used to build an aftermarket system. You can build an aftermarket system with the combination of a camera, LiDAR, or any of the three sensors that are right here, right? So it goes back to what is the purpose of the aftermarket platform. Um, is it just doing the fleet management? Is it just doing the data collection? And you know, the consumer-oriented aftermarket has a completely different purpose. But yes, um, you know, it, it's, it's more of a, um, a licensing and a tier integration. <clears throat> uh, my name is Amit, and uh, my question is, uh, so once the car reaches this level five, um, what's the interface going to be like? Is the user just going to enter the destination, and the car is going to take you there? Or once you're sitting in the car, can you tell the car, uh, you know, drive a little slower, my tummy is not feeling good, or drive a little faster, I'm in a hurry? Or you know, take a left turn here. Can it, uh, will it yeah. respond to those kinds yeah, of? Yeah, we see actually uh, OEM to OEM uh, differences in in in, in uh, how they would like the, the vehicle to behave. As you can imagine, uh, Tesla would typically uh, make a different decision and might make more aggressive moves because that's your typical Tesla uh, uh, driver slash passenger enjoys that. Uh, and a Mercedes S-Class uh, owner might prefer a more luxurious and behavior that's not kind of as, as uh, uh, aggressive. But within each model, uh, it, it, we, OEMs are talking about having the person who's controlling the vehicle, and we cannot call him the driver, right? Uh, the person who's controlling the vehicle decide the level of aggressiveness based on their personal preference. You know. Um, I, I love driving. When I look at these self-driving cars, the most favorite command I would like to give is to go park yourself. You know, I, I think that is the most frustrating part for a lot of us is to like, you know, how do you, um, where do you find the parking? How do you tell the car to, you know, park by itself? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, 
you will see in, you know, by the time you get level five, which is a ways out, like all of this is API driven and, and uh, you know, you're going to have all sorts of app that decides what to do. A lot of it will be mobility services where you get in some car that's not your own and depending on, you know, what service you're going to have, it's going to be, you know, different constraints and rules and what have you. Yeah, I, I would add, the, the underlying question is, when you talk about the level five vehicle, is it a vehicle that you own? Is it a service vehicle that's from Uber or something similar? Is it a vehicle that's, uh, that's uh, you know, um, uh, uh, limited to a certain geography, for example? And, uh, and th the answer is all of the above, right? So it's, it's gonna have to be a hybrid between the two. You can either just call the vehicle from your phone and it picks you up and then takes you to where you need to be, or you can set up preferences and parameters on your own app, or, or even within a vehicle, if something comes up and you have an emergency and you need a vehicle to stop and you can make a U-turn and, 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 and go to where you need to be. Um, uh, so, so all of that will be available at the fingertip of the, of the consumer, depending on which service they, they prefer or they will be using, whether they will own a vehicle, which vehicle manufacturer, so there will be you know, just like insurance, they all offer the same products, but they try to differentiate with just small things like accidents forgiveness and this and that. It's going to be the same thing. So some OEMs will probably market to you and say, hey, you can make up to five changes within the same trip if it's within 10 minutes. And some will say, no, we only take you from point A to point B, but then it's going to be a lot cheaper. You can't change your mind. It's that, that's, uh, all of that is, is logistics that are fairly... Um, fairly uh, you know, easy to solve, I guess. And speaking on mobility, do you think the current uh, leaders in mobility will survive the transformation to autonomy? Is that like a big change or is that like a simple it, thing for them? It, it will be a transition to what it's known today or will be known soon as the ridership economy. So it's not gonna be uh, you know, the uh, you know, autonomous vehicle industry or it's just gonna be a ridership economy. Um, and it's not just going to be for vehicles alone. It's going to be for a whole, you know, any, any autonomous machine or system, basically. And, um, and that, that's going to be a new economy where uh, the, the average number of occupants will be higher, per vehicle will be higher than it is today. Obviously, you will see less congestion, more people per vehicle. Um, uh, the, there will be new services inside these, uh, these uh, autonomous uh, vehicles and, and uh, it will be somewhat of a pivot, in my opinion, from the car sharing companies or, or any company actually that's operating in the mobility uh, space today to kind of shift over to um, serving up that ridership economy because at the end of the day, once the vehicle is, is driving on its own and uh, the, you know, and uh, the roads and everything else is figured out, the insurance is figured out, then the focus is on the people and who is inside the vehicle. How to accommodate them, how to provide the best service, how to, you know, make sure they are comfortable and, uh, and, uh, and how you can measure them, how you can make money out of them and how you can offer services that are hyper-targeted based on who they are, what they are, what activity they're doing, what emotions, what gender, what age group. All of that good stuff. So in my opinion, everything soon, or as soon as we start figuring out what the, um, you know, when, as soon as we have a, a somewhat of a, a close idea about when level five will hit, everything will shift to what would be a ridership economy in my opinion. Yeah. So it sounds like there's no privacy issues there at all. But, uh, yeah. um, okay, next question. Uh, Anisha Desai here, a lawyer who specializes on the regulatory side of autonomous vehicles and the, uh, we try to prepare ahead of time. I, I just want to question, uh, is it likely that in about 10, 15 years or otherwise, the same car will not only go on the road, but also go on the, in the skies, which uh, we talk about flying cars, and also swim in the ocean. Today we have three different sets of legislations or regulations. One on the road, Vienna Convention on Transportation, uh, on the air law, and also sea law. We need a convergence uh, law now for the vehicles and do you see that I've heard a lot about flying cars and we have studied a lot on that but and also autonomous but not on the cars that swim so same car can go in all three direction is there some movement on that as well there is there is we see all of the above and I would add the underground roads not just the surface roads 
Um, yeah, there are a number of companies developing uh, flying cars, whatever you want to call them. They call them, uh, they call them uh, drones that carry passengers, whatever you call them. Uh, it's a vehicle that, that, that carries you and is autonomous. Uh, that, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Uh, we, we have customers in that space. We support them with, with our LIDARs. Yeah. No, talking about the swimming cars, right? Is the there one? any swimming cars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There will be a retrofitting. I think I get your question. There will be a lot of retrofitting the same way Cruise started retrofitting regular cars into autonomous cars. There will be a retrofitting as well once, uh, you know, those vehicles, you know, where you can make multiple, multi use. Uh, or more than one use uh, out of them. There will be a lot of retrofitting. A lot of that's actually what what typically uh, th that's generally the first uh, trend that we see in most innovation. Something that already exists. How can you make it better? Or or you know go into multiple places or drive autonomously before we can even spend a lot of money, R and D resources on making it a uh, you know a, 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 an actual final product. So, in my opinion, it will be a lot of retrofitting, and, and the laws will somewhat converge uh, based on that retrofitting. Self-driving cars. Sorry. Smart cars. Why are we calling self-driving cars? They are becoming more smart cars now. Smart. Well, smart is. Yeah, smart is just a broad terminology, I think. Right. Yeah. All right, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll, um, all right, over, over here. This is a question for Ravi. Um, Ravi, you mentioned V2X. Uh, what can you say about the attention being paid to security? Because then, you know, in terms of V, V to X, which includes V to V, if there's any uh, malware danger to be, you know, downloaded into the car, are you addressing that in your systems? Sure. So today, all the communications that happen between the cars, we process the data and we provide warning mechanisms to the vehicle. Right? The only data that we write into the car is about the feedback mechanism that there's a potential collision um, you know, in the same lane or when you're trying to change a lane. So a lot of the communications in, in the V2X domain is based on PKI. Every message has a security certificate that ensures that the authenticity of the origination of the message. Right? Um, the framework also has a security credential management server managed on the internet. So that's the one that is actually um, coordinating who is the bad actors and you know how do we make sure that the cars that do not have the right certificates are repudiated. So. This is not a mesh network that we are creating. We are not trying to become a gateway of any data that can be passed from one car to another car. This is more of a single hop mechanism where the data is processed and you know it's only given as a feedback. We can do the actuation, but that's sort of the next stage when we go into level four and level five. So you know today there's a lot of restriction in terms of what can be read and what can be written into the canvas and you know most tier one suppliers have a secure can layer so we are reading a lot of the data we process the information coming from outside the car but what we provide back to the vehicle is very limited it's very restricted okay great so we're gonna um, wrap this one thank you very much uh, Ravi Madar Lue and and they'll all be in the back afterwards if anybody has uh, questions to ask them and then we're going to switch on to governmental and regulatory panel shortly. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rahul.